Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. Far less chilly than our last meeting. Uh, and fortunately, no snow, so the gods have been good to us. <laughs> uh, this is continuing our series uh, on total recovery. Uh, for those of you who've been here before, you'll get to hear my spiel yet again, and you can sleep through it. Um, but for those who've not, what I want to talk about is kind of what's unifying all of these lectures and what's bringing us together and why we're looking at all these different pieces. We've had, you know, the issues of chronic pain and depression or post-traumatic stress syndrome or chronic anxiety disorders. One of the things both these conditions have in common is that we take your word for it. You tell us you have pain, we have to believe you. There's no way we can actually measure that you have pain. Uh, we may ask you to rate your pain on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, but taking an x-ray will not necessarily confirm that you have pain. Indeed, if we look at the majority of people who have osteoarthritis, uh, the x-rays may be horrible and they may not have any complaints whatsoever. And on the other hand, we'll have a number of people that we take a look at the x-rays and the x-rays are completely normal. The scans are completely normal and yet they complain of fairly incapacitating uh, debilitating pain. Same thing with neuropsychiatric illness. You're depressed, we take your word for it by virtue of your actions and the way you respond to things, but there isn't a blood test we can do for it. There isn't a scan we can do for it, although that's not entirely true. There's actually some scans uh, now being approved for being able to diagnose depression. But the question has always been what's been at the basis of this. The other part of the problem is these are huge problems. So we have, according to the Institute of Medicine's most recent report, 100 million people in this country. 100 million people in this country suffering with chronic pain. As far as depression or neuropsychiatric illness, it will affect approximately 17 million people over the course of their lifetime. These are big problems. And when they occur together, they're disasters. Our success rate in treating chronic pain and success rate in treating depression at best approaches about 48% in terms of our present therapeutic approaches. If these conditions occur together, our success rate of treating them is abysmal. By one study, 9%. Random. It is a zero success rate for all intents and purposes. And the problem has been a lack of understanding of the physiology of these conditions, and thus a lack of understanding of what the real targets are in order to make improve these conditions. So. There we go. As life turns out, the evidence has been accumulating that the root of the problem is that both of these conditions, chronic pain conditions, also chronic fatigue, and most neuropsychiatric conditions in terms of depression, generalized anxiety disorders, bipolar disease, are at their basis neuroinflammatory. And at the basis of being neuroinflammatory, what drives neuroinflammation in the central nervous system is the hyperregulation of a little cell called the microglia. Microglia is part of the innate immune system in the central nervous system. It is the innate immune system in the central nervous system. And it is what drives inflammation, for the most part, in the central nervous system. And it's completely necessary to have this little guy around because if you get an infection in the system, it has to go after it and kill it. If you end up with trauma to the central nervous system, it initiates the repair process. The problem comes in is when you upregulate this guy too many times, he stays in a hyperreactive state and your brain stays in a hyperinflamed state. So my research has demonstrated that basically it's microglial activation that's at the basis of what's going on in most of these neuroinflammatory conditions. Well, okay. If we know that the microglia is at the basis of this, then the question is, what is it that will potentially set off the microglia? What is it that aggravates them, that causes them to move into inflammatory state and start the process of neuroinflammation? And the answer is a wide range of things. So ischemia, that is a loss of blood supply, so is it a stroke? Hypoxia. Hypoxia occurs far more frequently than you think. It's a loss of oxygen to the blood. Obviously, if you're drowning or you're strangling, you've had a loss of oxygen to your blood. But 5% of the population strangles every night because they have sleep apnea. And most of the cases of sleep apnea are undiagnosed. 
So hypoxia isn't as income and infrequent as we'd like to think. It's actually very frequent. And so it's one of the things that you need to be looking at. There are a number of medications that cause upregulation of the microglia. Unfortunately, one of those medications or one family of medications are opioids. Opioids cause microglia to move into a hyperreactive state. The hyperreactive state of opioids, now this is talking about codeine and morphine, uh, all the medications that frequently were used to treat chronic pain, unfortunately. These uh, medications will cause the microglia to hyperreact. Uh, the hyperreactivity of the microglia is what causes tolerance to build to the opioids and causes hyperalgesia, that is, increased pain response. So in fact, using morphine, using the opioid narcotics in the majority of cases is probably contraproductive. Now, you can use it short term, and the reason you get away with using it short term is because the number of receptors on the neurons is about five times that on the microglia. So short term use of opioids makes sense for pain control. Long term use, you have the microglia coming into place. So knowing about microglia says, okay, wait a minute, maybe we want to change the medications that we'll use. But it also tells us maybe there are medications we can use specifically to target the microglia to downregulate them. Toxins is another thing that will upregulate microglia. Biotoxins in forms of uh, molds, okay, in forms of <coughs> toxins that can actually be transmitted by poisonous spider bites and can be transmitted by ticks. So Lyme tick, the ticks that you get, can transmit not just simply the various Lyme and Lyme-related diseases, but they can also cause a toxic reaction in themselves. Heavy metals, such as lead, will upregulate the microglia. Trauma, trauma in terms of traumatic brain injury, trauma in terms of psychological trauma, will also upregulate the microglia. So I had one woman that I was working with who has been complaining of uh, whiplash injury and development of fibromyalgia, which is a generalized pain syndrome. She. Uh, uh, was 18 years old when she was originally involved in the car accident. Uh, and <clears throat> the thing about microglial activity is that it's very unusual for a single event to set them off. That is, they will be set off, but down-regulate and go back into their resting state uh, after the event has passed. So that if a microglia is remained upregulated, if somebody's coming in in a neuro chronic neuroinflammatory state, then they have to have had multiple assaults or well, they have to have had one really massive assault in order to set this stuff off. So she tells me she's in a relatively minor car accident, whiplash injury, and subsequently over the next two years devolves into fibromyalgia. This is not an unusual story in terms of how people get these generalized pain syndromes. But except that, I'm sitting here going, wait a minute, what else is there? And in the process of pushing back in her history, I find that when she's 12 years old, she was raped and she has post-traumatic stress syndrome. Not because she was raped, but because she's sitting there crying, trembling, completely reliving the experience, and she's never told anybody about this before. That's the setup. That's where, in her case, the thing began. The secondary setup was the secondary concussion, minor concussion, associated from the car accident. And then we set off, now we have the microglia in a chronically upregulated state, and we have chronic pain. We have to treat, in order to resolve this problem, both conditions. But now we're reviewing this problem as a neuroinflammatory disease as opposed to, okay, go to the psychiatrist, go to get the PTSD taken care of, and as a separate issue completely from the pain. They are not separate. They are just different manifestations of a neuroinflammatory disease. So the importance of what we're talking about here is a redefinition of these conditions, a redefinition of taking down of the silos, the difference between neuropsychiatric conditions and most medical conditions, chronic fatigue syndrome, pain, irritable bowel syndrome, all of these are manifestations of what is now, what we're now going to be calling central sensitization syndrome. Infections, Lyme disease, all the associated Lyme uh, phenomena, Epst chronic Epstein-Barr is a whole list of things because microglia are part of the innate immune system of the body. And so basically they respond to infections, they respond to viruses. Their job is to kill them, isolate them, make them go away. And then neurodegenerative diseases. Now, neurodegenerative diseases, we put in a little bit of a separate category because we're not entirely certain how the microglia respond 
on what their role is in the neurodegenerative diseases. In this case, we're talking about Alzheimer's, AIDS-related dementia, multiple sclerosis. Clearly, the microglia were involved. At one point, they were thought to be causative, but now it's thought that perhaps it's a mis dysfunction of the microglia that may be associated with these conditions. We also want to separate that out a bit because at this moment, the neurodegenerative diseases, okay, are much tougher to treat. All of the rest of these conditions that set off the inflammation in the central nervous system cause neurodegeneration. And this is another crucial piece of information to keep in mind because it means that when the process starts, it's much easier to treat it at the beginning than it is a decade or two decades or three decades later. I love my kids. I love the teenagers I get to work with in the 20-somethings because they have a huge amount of plasticity and their brains will regenerate and heal. It is much, much tougher to deal with these problems when they've been around for decades and we're dealing with people in their 50s and their 60s. And we get much less, we don't get as great a result in most of those individuals as we do in the teenagers, which can be completely recovered. So we're redefining this business as central sensitization syndrome. This is the co-occurrence of chronic pain and any neuropsychiatric condition. Frankly, as my research has expanded, it's also extending into chronic fatigue syndrome, and it's extended into conditions such as uh, irritable bowel syndrome and a lot of sleep disturbances. These conditions are neuroinflammatory by definition. They are neurodysregulatory. They screw up the hormonal functioning of the body. They screw up the normal processing of information in the brain. And they are neurodegenerative. So it is critical that we treat them early and treat them aggressively. It is also important to understand that they are multi- uh, etiologic. So they come, there's a series of problems that have ultimately led to setting them off, not usually a single event. And so we have to go looking into the history about all of the potential things that have potentially caused the problem. And if you go through the etiologies, you've got clearly a genetic predisposition in some individuals, trauma that we've already talked about in both physical and psychological form, Lyme disease, chronic Epstein-Barr, parasites can all have contributed to this. I've certainly seen several people who have had cases of malaria uh, that began uh, this process for them, or dengue fever. Uh, toxins, uh, which we talked about, medications, sleep disturbances, sleep apnea, but also su significant disruptions of the circadian cycle. I have some kids with some really severe circadian rhythm disorders. They do not go to bed until 4 or 5 in the morning. Their sleep is highly disrupted. They may have nights where they don't sleep, and they then... Uh, uh, sometimes we'll manage to get four or five hours of sleep, all right? We have to get their sleep cycles fixed before anything else is going to fix. And so it's, we really have to go after this aggressively. Metabolic issues in terms of thyroid disease, autoimmune disease, diseases such as celiac disease. Uh, I have uh, a patient who uh, came in suicidally depressed, a uh, 17-year-old kid. Um, he's been treated by the psychiatrist, fairly unresponsive to the uh, psychiatric medications, uh, behavioral problems, uh, because we look at this as a neuroinflammatory disease and started asking a different set of questions, we found that he had celiac disease, gluten, unable to eat gluten, autoimmune disease of gluten. We've taken that out of his diet. Uh, we've done some other things because there are other inflammatory conditions going on in his bowels that we've also addressed, the end result of which is his depression is dramatically better. It's essentially gone. Uh, and he's been attentive and uh, participating in class, far more successful. The healing time on this stuff, once we finally get it out of the system and once we're able to address it, takes about a year, 18 months. So the brain does take a while to, to repair. Treatment of this stuff then gives us lots of different ways to approach this, but we have to think about this now as neuroinflammatory and what it is we're doing to lower the issue uh, with the hyperactivity of this microglia. Meditation is one particularly effective way to actually reduce microglial activity and cause neuroregeneration. Jonathan Faust gave a, a wonderful lecture on that. Um, prolotherapy, regenerative medicine, this is all about, a, and David Luang talked about that on our last session, this is about addressing the muscle skeletal components of what's going on that continues with the pain generators. So pain will beget pain. Pain keeps the microglia inflamed as well. And so it's critical that we address any of the peripheral phenomena that are continuing uh, to feed into the pain phenomena. Nutritional issues, 
huge topic. Uh, we're going to have our next lecture uh, will be by uh, Seth Kahn on March 6th. Uh, he's a bariatric specialist, nutritionist, uh, and uh, so Seth will be addressing a great deal more on that. Uh, sleep disorders, which we've already talked about, assessing medications. Uh, about 20% of women, by the way, will uh, develop chronic pain uh, and neuropsychiatric illness in menopause. Estrogen withdrawal is one of the things that, ha that is, a, this is a consequence of estrogen withdrawal setting off these receptors. And so it's important in these women that we keep them on hormone replacement therapy. Acupuncture has been very effective in reducing these conditions, and we've seen functional MRI studies demonstrating this. Uh, physiotherapy, again, addressing the whole issue of a musculoskeletal input into this. Uh, I'm sorry, psychotherapy, addressing the neuropsychiatric component of this. They need to go hand in glove, but you're now looking at this as a continuation on a spectrum as opposed to separate issues handled by separate practitioners. Exercise, extremely effective in neuroregeneration and downregulation of microglia, except that in people who have true chronic fatigue, one of the hallmarks of chronic fatigue is that uh, they have non-regenerative, non-restorative exercise patterns. So if you have them exercise uh, and they become exhausted after doing so, it'll be, the day, it'll be a day later, and that actually makes them considerably worse for several days or potentially weeks afterwards. So it's important in those people that you be very careful about how you uh, prescribe your exercise patterns. So that's my book. It'll be published May 6th. It's being reduced, released by Rodale uh, here. It's going to be published in England and in South Korea. Uh, by two other publishers, and it will talk about everything that we're talking about here in this lecture series and lay out in much greater detail. The book is written for uh, the lay people. It's not written specifically uh, for physicians, so there's certainly enough research background in the book and citations in the book uh, for physicians as well. So I hope uh, you'll join me in celebrating when we get to release uh, the book when it comes out.